Hi, this is Dr. Katherine D. Harris. This is another lecture video for English 56B. This is the sex, second video on Jane Eyre. This one will be on empire and national identity. If you take a look at the screen, uh, we, what we've got for today is Jane Eyre chapter 17 through 38 to the conclusion. And this is really where we get to talk about empire a lot. This is also where Kipling comes in, and I'm going to talk about the imperial gothic too a little bit. Thanks to Ravithi Krishnaswamy, one of the other professors here who is an expert in this particular field. You will have a blog post that's due um, Sunday at 10 a.m. On Friday uh, at, by 10 a.m. the Dickens serial blog post is due, so I want to give you a couple days after that to write the one that's going to go with this particular um, this particular uh, lecture. Okay, so one of the things that happens that we didn't do for the Romantic period was talk about laboring class in terms of the high Romantics, and I wanted to give you an idea uh, about what industrialism entailed, and a big part of that was moving bodies around and moving ships around and finding trade routes. So th that came back to the British, and especially in London, in a variety of ways, and the violence that occurred with the slave trade, industrialism, and the use of colonialism and imperialism to create the empire was uh, quite devastating to the reputation of the British, though they were probably the most powerful of all time during the Victorian period. They had an unparalleled set of ships. So let me take you over to a PowerPoint. Oh. So we began the Romantic era with the French Revolution, 1775, the slave trade peaks with 38,000 to 42,000 slaves who have been trapped. They could be bought for 15 pounds per person. That's about 50 U.S. dollars at that particular time. Most of these slaves were shipped via the Middle Passage. They were. This is actual bodies. This is how they would be lined up in a ship. About 13% died. A sale price later on would be, you bring it up to about 35 pounds per person. The profits were 600,000 to a million pounds annually. In 1807, we have the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, but not slavery itself. 1833 sees the emancipation of the slaves in the Caribbean in 1833. So we're just about to embark on the Victorian period. But at this particular time, you have to remember that the empire, the British Empire, is going to expand, and they need people be, to be able to work in their colonial holdings. And the primary thing they were doing was farming. There was sugar cane and things like that, uh, and they would export those back to England. So there's a little bit of prior history that you need to have. In 1660, 1660 there was the chartering of the Royal African Company. In 1713, there was the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht, U-T-R-E-C-T. -E it granted England monopoly rights to the slave trade. In 19th century, the British abolitionists had an intense involvement in American slavery. Race connected to intellect and moral propriety, and women in slavery became intertwined in terms of ethical rights, and women took up the cause. They saw marriage as slavery, and it was the attempt to abolish slavery was an attempt to also uh, bolster their own rights. So this is Turner's slave ship. If you take a look down here, this is a slave ship in which uh, it was very famous at this particular time, around before 1840, where it was on the Middle Passage. Some of the slaves became ill, and then it became an epidemic. And so they just started throwing some of the slaves overboard to stem the tide of the epidemic. So this down here is a scene of sharks attacking and eating those slaves who were still alive and thrown overboard. And there's a close-up. So this is a detail from Turner's painting, which is based on a 1781 event. Captain Luke Collingwood threw 132 plague-infected Africans to the sharks in order to collect insurance on this jettisoned cargo. And it's in an anthology by Malor and Matlack on page 54. 
So George Canning, in March 16, 1824, gave the speech on the topic of abolition of slavery. So he says, In dealing with the Negro, sir, we must remember that we're dealing with a being possessing the form and strength of a man, but the intellect only of a child. So let me break away for a moment. So there's, a, there's infantilizing of this individual, and he's seen or she is seen as other. And I put quote more air quotes around other because there is this idea be that because they looked differently, because they were marked on the body, because they were wild, because they were part of nature, that they were necessarily not intellectually as high as the British were. And this is also because there's a language barrier. To turn him loose in the manhood of his physical strength, in the maturity of his physical passions, but in the infancy of his uninstructed reason, would be to raise up a creature resembling the splendid fiction of a recent romance. Uh, it's Mary Shelley wrote The Last Man. The hero of which constructs a human form, with all the corporeal capabilities of man and with the thews and sinews of a giant, but being unable to impart to the work of his hands a perception of right and wrong, he finds too late that he has only created a more than mortal power of doing mischief, and himself recoils from the monster which he has made. So this is a direct reference to Frankenstein by Mary Shelley as well. So we see a condemnation of Victor Frankenstein here, but also an equation with this reconstructed um, dead bodies being equated with these people who are slaves, these Africans. He continues on, such would be the effect of a sudden emancipation before the Negro was prepared for the enjoyment of well-regulated liberty. I therefore, sir, would proceed gradually because I would proceed safely. So there was also a fear in Parliament uh, that, the, that these slaves would, in some way with their freedom, not understand the social construct of civilization. This is the core of white man's burden that I had you read by Rudyard Kipling. The responsibility of the white man to civilize the savages and anything savage within them. So throughout all of the novels that we'll read, including the second half of Jane Eyre, every time you see somebody described as wild, think about it, or dark and swarthy, or dark complected, Think about it in terms of this particular idea of white man's burden, that this is a re reminiscent of the savage. So this is from a, uh, a literary annual, the 1830 comic annual. It's a parody of Byron's poem, She Walks in Beauty Like the Night. Uh, this wasn't exact, This it wasn't what um, Byron meant, but this is a play on what's called the African Hottentot woman who had an accentuated bosom and a, an accentuated derriere, and she was brought back from Africa and displayed all around England as something as an anomaly in physicality. So this is William Blake, who's very famous for uh, other engravings. It's Flagellation of a Female Sambo Slave, 1796. And this is the punishment. And it says, Stedman witnessed this in 1774, and she was given 200 lashes for, for basically refusing to be raped by the overseer. So John Stedman created these series of engravings and then put them in a narrative of five years exposition against the rolled Negroes of Suriname from the year 1772 to 1777. This actually helped abolish the slave trade and slavery itself. This is the official medallion of the British Anti-Slavery Society, 1795 by Josiah Wedd. I am not a man and a brother. Am I not a, am I not a man and a brother? So this is very famous um, individual, Ulata Equiano. He's often claimed by the Americans and the British as being part of their literary heritage. He wrote his autobiography called An Interesting Narrative, and he used the rhetorical strategies that are often used when people are writing autobiographies or novels for England and America. It was uh, it was almost like Jane, except this was a true story. He taught him he was a slave. He bought himself out of slavery. He lived in England. He taught himself English. He taught himself how to be literate. And then he wrote this best-selling autobiography. Um, and we're not really sure who Ed Equiano was. It's supposedly one of these two men, but we don't really know for sure. <laughs> 
and here's an ad for his interesting narrative. Uh, this work is neatly printed on a good paper in Dewey Decimo. Dewey Decimo is the size of the book. It's about the size of your hand, Dewey Decimo, pocket size, and comprised of two handsome volume. Price is seven shillings unbound. So immediately you see that the first thing that's being advertised is the form of the book itself. Uh, and, and then they have the frontispiece, which is the engraving. That's the second thing that's advertised. And then the following paragraphs are actually talking about what are the contents. So take a moment to pause the video right here and read this advertisement. So this is from William Blake's Songs of Innocence, and it's called The Little Black Boy, and it's an idea about masculine romanticism. Take a moment to pause this one and read The Little Black Boy. You notice that the way that William, Bla William Blake writes about this child is as a child of nature, with all of the innocence that is uh, relevant to any child. Here we have a scene from the Friendship's Offering for 1830. It's us a scene of industrialization. If you look over the right side of the engraving over the shoulder of the boy, there is a house and a chimney. It's a very uh, rural scene. And then in the far distance in the left, you see that's a city. And what they're doing is carrying around pies and food, and they've all paused to hear the latest news. So everybody was reading things that were coming from the cities, and they wanted to know what was happening. So they would have been aware of the slave trade. They would have been aware of Ulata Equiano. Uh, they would have been aware of the changes and the shifts in, in industrialization. And they all always wanted to know what were the latest adventures. So I mentioned this once before. Hannah Moore is an evangelical Christian abolitionist anthropologist, and what she would do would commission writing these cheap repository tracts that were made to be given away, sold very cheaply, in the late 18th century. And uh, it says it's in order to teach servants and other members of the laboring classes how to behave, so basically how to behave within their own class. So the background is that in 1788 there's a publication of a poem called Slavery, a Poem, and this is part of her uh, abolitionist movement. She's part of the Evangelical Christians. Now we see what uh, this kind of Christianity does in Jane Eyre in terms of what happens at the school that she goes to. It, it's very strict and it's unfair. Cheap repository tracts were published 1795 to 98. There are booklets of poetry, Bible stories, and really simple allegories. They often had theological meanings. They're tales of fiction, of fictional instruction. And they were really designed to inculcate homely virtues and habits of sound living. It's an attempt to introduce Christianity to the working class or the poor. It was wholesome reading material for poor to encourage attaining or maintaining respectability in poverty. And here you have another one. A poor man tells of his devotion to the Bible, his sick wife, and eight children. And this is, again, another one of those cheap repository tracts. One more, because I couldn't help it. I found them, and I thought they were really cool. Now, just to give you a little bit of information about the mid to late Victorians and what happens with this sense of empire. So the history is that during the um, 1780s and 1790s, there were these uh, Zulu, or, or I'm sorry, 1880s and 1890s Zulu Wars. There was also, in which the British got their asses kicked, there was also Irish agitation for separation in the 1860s. And the thing is that Ireland as an island was integral to the defense of England, so they really, England really wanted to keep them as a colonial holding. But the, Brit the Irish were so adamant about not having to uh, be part of British rule anymore that they created the Sinn Féin or the Irish Republican Army in the 1880. And they began terrorist campaigns in London. Now this is the first time that the British are seeing battles at home instead of abroad and England is no longer isolated from violence. Joseph Chamberlain writes in The True Conception of Empire, um, published in 1897, that uh, he calls them little, little Englanders is a sarcastic view of critics of the imperial expansion. 
his rhetoric is you didn't have to read this but if you like to look it up uh, it's it's under some of the things that are uh, in your readings for today uh, the rhetoric was laughter and cheers included in parentheticals and he writes about the true concept of empire it's no longer about possessions it's self-governing colonies that have some autonomy it's a sentiment of kinship it's imagery of the sea it's a sense of obligation because the natives outnumber the Europeans or the whites. And it's justified if you can show that it adds happiness and prosperity that the natives haven't known otherwise. Now, this is the white man's burden almost exactly. Empire is necessary if it can show that it adds happiness and prosperity that natives haven't known otherwise. And Chamberlain acknowledges that the mission requires some bloodshed. Okay. And he calls it Pax Britannica. And it's a comparison to Roman Empire. The Latin is a representation of British peace. Now, Kipling with a White Man's Burden is published in 18, 1899. It's very satirical, but it leads us into talking about the Imperial Gothic. Now, the British novel has becomes an imperial gothic novel, 1880 to 1940, 1914. The main characteristics of the imperial gothic are blends adventure with gothic elements. It combines a seemingly scientific and progressive, often Darwinian ideology of imperialism with an antithetical interest in the occult. Typically, British characters find themselves in various bizarre, unusual locations in the far reaches of the empire where they have mysterious, terrifying experiences that involve going native or descending into primitive occult phenomenon. There's a use of sexualized, eroticized, colonized female body to mediate racial, cultural, political, social relationships between men. And in contrast to Britain and Europe, it's the imperial Gothic and the empire is seen as the space of the rational, or, or Britain and Europe is seen as the space of the rational and the knowledgeable. Um, the colonized space is the site of the occult and the irrational with strange gods, unspeakable rites, and it's the, it's the flip side of the spiritual orient. The Imperial Gothic offers salvation answers for seekers of religious truths, um, but it doesn't offer that, sorry. The Imperial Gothic does, Gothic does not offer seekers of religious truth that value. It offers instead images of, of decline and fall, civilization turning into savagery. And there's a couple of images that I want to show you. There's a justification. We talked about eugenics before. and the use of phrenology just a little bit. So we're going to deal with this uh, today. It, the, the, main, the Imperial Gothic expresses intense but displaced engagement with political and social problems. It reflects anxieties about the weakening of imperial power precisely when the empire was at its climax. So it's a little bit odd. Um, Kipling, Rudyard Kipling's version of the Imperial Gothic in his tales are typically about white men who get caught up in strange situations and they feel vulnerable or persecuted by Indian men uh, over whom they should be in control or they should exercise power. Right? Uh, and Rudyard Kipling is actually best known as one of the practitioners of Imperial Gothic uh, and three things that are really, if you need to know all of them, that you should know. Imperial Gothic is a regression to barbarism or going native. It's an invasion of civilization by savage or demonic forces. It's a, a diminution of opportunities for manly adventure and heroism. And the major people are Robert Louis Stevenson, Rudyard Kipling, and Joseph Conrad and Ryder Haggard. Now, Rudyard Kipling is an expat. He's British, but he was born in India and he went to England to go to school, but he hates it there, so he returns to India to work as a newspaper man. Uh, he writes a huge amount of novels, including The Jungle Book, Ganga Din, Kim, The Man Who Would Be King. And his uh, fa most famous quotes are, of course, The White Man's Burden, which you have already read. So one of the things I want you to remember about the Imperial Gothic is really this idea of going native, the barbarism of it, because we see Rochester described in this particular way. And if you take a look at these advertisements for Pear Soap, some of you may find them in your Dickens cereals. You'll see that 
Here we have pear soap is written on a rock, and then we have the natives bowing down to it. This is the conquering brand name. And then this is a very famous one. This is all taken from Anne McClintock's book called Imperial Leather. It's two children. One gets into a bath, and it's a an African baby. He comes out, and he's he's whitewashed basically so the soap has allowed him to change his skin color to that of the regular but not his face and if you take a look at this one the white man's burden pairs soap and this is a ship's captain and he's washing away everything that's around him so that he be he becomes more civilized and if you can blow this up this video up you can see on this side down here we have a missionary who's offering soap to one of the natives in order to cleanse himself both through his soul morally ethically everything and then in ends up domesticating him and civilizing him so the imperial domesticity And I have a second one. I had a second one. Let's see if I can pull that one up. Just a second. So this is how the British uh, figured out that they were at the top of the scale. If we take a look at the top two images, we get the progression. The family group of um, Kettering is inventing the family of man. It, it goes from Simeon to Africans to Greeks, Chinese, and then to Greek, to, no, this to, to your Asians, and then to Greek itself, and then we get the same thing here. Time, progress at a glance, Africans, and then the Greeks. So the British are really trying to cement their place in history, and here we have Time's waxworks. So this is Old Father Time. We see uh, the degeneration. You see that there's the Zulu warrior, and here we have uh, the Eurasians as they move forward in sophistication and civilization. But what we have here is an anomaly. That's an Irishman. So you see that there is some backlash in the historicizing of the Irish in relationship to the British themselves. Now what I'd like to do is just, if you want to look away from the screen, we don't really have much more to show you. Uh, I want to go over to Jane Eyre chapters 18, 18 to 38, and I want to deal with this idea of Bertha Mason and empire. In chapter 26, and this is on page 247, we're going to do 247 and 256. So in chapter 26, on page 246, um, down towards the end, it says, I require and charge you both, as you will answer at that dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, and then it's, it's the moment where Rochester is about to um, be married. He paused, as is the custom, when is the pause after that sentence? And then somebody steps up and says, when a distinct and near voice said, the marriage cannot go on, I declare the existence of an impediment. So at that particular moment, we start to see that Rochester is about to be unearthed or undone. And if we go over to um, page 247, still in chapter 26, at the very bottom, and it's Mr. Briggs talking, and he says, Certainly, Mr. Briggs calmly took a paper from his pocket and read out in a sort of official nasal voice. So very much part of the clerical aspect of the empire. I affirm and can prove that on the 20th of October, A.D., a date of 15 years back, Edward Fairfax Rochester of Thornfield Hall in the county of blank uh, and of Ferndean Manor in Blankshire, England, was married to my sister Bertha Antoinetta Mason, daughter of Jonas Mason, merchant and of Antoinetta, his wife, a Creole. <laughs> 
at Blank Church, Spanish Town, Jamaica. The record of the marriage will be found in the register of that church. A copy of it is now in my possession, signed Richard Mason. So the fact that Bertha's mother, Bertha Antoinetta Mason, is a Creole means that she's of mixed descent. That means that what Rochester has done is import Bertha Mason from Jamaica to England, knowing that she and and will qualify her as a savage, and knowing that she has this wild streak to her. So he becomes inculcated or severely entrenched into the empire with this importation of Bertha as almost a commodity or a good. In chapter 36, we learn of what happens in that particular moment after Jane has left. So on page 361, turning the pages... On 361, and this is chapter 36, down at the end. Now, Bronte was really brilliant at bringing out this relationship between Jane Eyre and the reader itself, and she does it by allowing Jane to address the reader directly. Uh, and she says, Hear an illustration, reader. A lover finds his mistress asleep on a mossy bank. He wishes to catch a glimpse of her fair face without waking her. He steals softly over the grass, careful to make no sound. He pauses, fancying she has stirred. He withdraws. Not for worlds would he be seen. All is still he again. And this continues on, and it sounds like a fantasy. And then it gets down to the end, and it says, He thus grasps and cries and gazes, because he no longer fears to waken by any sound he can utter, by any movement he can make. He thought his love slept sweetly. He finds she is stone dead. I looked with timorous joy towards a stately house. I saw a blackened ruin. Jane returns to Thornfield, and what she sees is that it has burned down. She sees evidence of it. And then on page 365, a few pages later, we get the fire on page 364, a description of her. Now, Bertha is described as the mad woman in the attic, flaming hair. Again, we return to this idea of hair. Her hair is unruly, unkempt, long, and, and dispersed everywhere. So at the bottom of 364, we get that, he, we get that whole narration about the fire, but 364 at the bottom. Yes, indeed, was he, and he went up to the attics when all was burning above and below and got the servants out of their beds and helped them down himself. So he's benevolent, Mr. Rochester, and went back to get his mad wife out of her cell, and then they called out to him that she was on the roof, where she was standing, waving her arms above the battlements and shouting out till they could hear her a mile off. I saw her and heard her with my own eyes. She was a big woman and had long black hair. We could see it streaming against the flames as she stood. I witnessed and several more witnessed Mr. Rochester ascend through the skylight onto the roof. We heard him call, Bertha! We saw him approach her and then, ma'am, she yelled and gave a spring and the next minute she lay smashed on the pavement, dead. Dead. That is the result of Bertha. She can no longer live in the world in which she is not supposed to be in. She was brought from Jamaica. But she could not actually... It's not clear whether Rochester drove her crazy or whether she was already insane. Uh, he locked her away and refused to acknowledge her in an attic. And this doesn't do any much good for Rochester's reputation, but Jane seems to forget give him for doing this to another woman. In fact, the, the fact that he's going to be so catastrophically wounded and blinded from this, which eventually comes back, uh, seems to soften Jane towards him. So Jane is independent at this particular time. She gains money. Uh, she's about independent of Rochester. She's about to marry Rochester. Um, in, in chapter three, she narrowly avoids uh, m marrying her cousin, but she gains this independence through money in chapter 33, but she's got a contrary development in chapter 34. So if we turn over page th 339, at the very bottom, and this is where she's with Diana and Mary, her cousins, and Sinjin. And he says, 
As for me, I daily wish more to please him, but to do so, I felt daily more and more that I must disown half my nature, stifle half my faculties, wrest my taste from their original bent, force myself to the adoption of pursuits for which I had no natural vocation. It's almost as if she's trying to force herself back into that evangelical Christian education that she revolted against, but she's, Sinjin is wanting to be a missionary, wants to marry her, wants to go do good, but she cannot suppress that natural side of her. That she doesn't want to do this. She wants her independence. And we see more of that on page 344. By the way, this is in chapter um, 34 still. 344. So on 344, A little ways down, it says very willingly, and then right below that, I can do what he wants me to do. I am forced to see and acknowledge that I meditated. That is, if life be spared me, but I feel mine is not the existence to be long protracted under an Indian sun. What then? does He does not care for that. When my time came to die, he would resign me in all serenity and sanctity to the God who gave me. The case is very plain before me. In leaving England, I should leave a loved but empty land. Mr. Rochester is not there. It's not the bottom. Alas, if I join St. John, I abandon half myself. If I go to India, I go to premature death. India, I go to premature death. And how will the interval between leaving England for India and India for the grave be filled? And then she goes on to chronicle. It doesn't sound like a very intriguing life for her. It sounds like it would almost be servitude. And at that particular moment, she requires freedom and she asks for it. In chapter 37, on 369, she reunites herself with the blind Rochester. And that entire page in chapter 39, uh, with this reunited moment, is that Rochester can't physically see, but he has some form in, of enlightenment through his blindness, and that endears Jane to him. Uh, and she goes through and watches him in, on 369, and he hears her voice and immediately recognizes her. And her response to him is, My dear master, I answered, I am Jane Eyre. I have found you out. I am come back to you. She finally declares herself and empowers herself. And he says, My living darling, the, these are certainly her limbs and the, these are features, but I cannot be so blessed after all my misery. Is it a dream, such dreams as I have had at night when I have clasped her once more to my heart, as I do now, and kissed her as thus, and felt that she loved me and trusted that she would not leave me, which I never will, sir, from this day. Chapter 37 on 370, she declares herself her power. She tells a little bit about herself midway through uh, and and tells him that she has gained money. But as you're a rich Jane, you have now no doubt friends who will look after you and not suffer you to devote yourself to a blind lamenter like me. I told you I am independent, sir, as well as rich. I am my own mistress. <laughs> I am my own mistress. <laughs> Sorry about that. And certainly you will stay with me? And he says, and she says, yes, I will. And the rest of that chapter really chronicles that. But the most important is chapter 38, page 384. And this is the most significant part of this novel. And I, I'm torn between personally wanting to throw the novel across the room versus applauding Jane for writing herself into existence and being so powerful. <laughs> Excuse me. It says the conclusion, chapter 38. Reader, I married him. And that's almost the conclusion of it, as if she's come full circle. And on page 383, at the very bottom, uh, and talks about Adele, and she ends as being pregnant. Uh, and that last, she says, my tale draws to its close, one word respecting my experience of married life, and one brief glance at the fortune of those whose names have most frequently recurred in this narrative, and I have done. I've now been married ten years, so now we've skipped. We've skipped uh, qu almost ten years after chapter ten, and now at the conclusion we're skipping ten years between the time when she's actually written this particular novel. I know what it is to live entirely for and with what I love best on earth, 
I hold myself supremely blessed. Do you notice at this particular moment that Jane switches to present tense? No woman was ever nearer to her mate than I am, ever more absolutely bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Down a little bit further, he miraculously regains his sight. So everything is all well. I think this is why people like Jane Eyre, because it, it's one of the few Victorian novels that actually <laughs> ends on uh, a good note. Okay, so you have, if you're staring at the schedule right now, you have a blog post based on this lecture that's due on Sunday the 9th by 10 a.m. It's 300 to 500 words, and the tag is Jane Eyre. And here it is. This is a bit of a long one, so listen. Colonialism, national pride, and the British Empire surface very subtly in this novel in the second half. Where do you see representations of these in the characters, the landscape, the setting, the physical structures, the insistence on proper and moral behavior? Use evidence from the text. Make sure that you adhere to the writing tips. No first person.